double 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 p podcast double p what i like to call double 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 p what i like to call double 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 p podcast welcome to ice cold a podcast about amc's the terror this year we're talking about season two the terror infamy in this episode we're going to break down all the exciting events of episode five shatter like a pearl my name is Bubba, and with me, as always, is somebody who's known to bag it. It's Catfish. Catfish, how you doing? I am doing delicious tonight, Bubba. Everyone should know we did this as soon as humanly possible. We're both traveling. We apologize for it being late, but until we make more than nothing, which is what we're making on these podcasts, we still have to do other things in life to sustain us financially. Uh, doing these podcasts sustains me metaphysically. Also with us every week is Mork. Mork, how you doing? Wait a minute. Oh, no. Mork isn't able to come tonight. This is terrible. Oh, man. Well, should we just should we just do like the Yure and bag it? I say we have to go forward mainly because... All right. Let's go forward. Because our double L's... Double L's? Our loyal listeners have given us lots of big feedback, which we're going to cover right at the top before we break into the episode. Catfish, are you ready to hear what our double L's have told us? I'm not only ready to hear it, but also, if pressed into service, I will read some of it. Well, why don't you read this first one from Twitter? All right, from L. Quint, at L. E-L underscore Q-U-E-N-T underscore. I love this fourth episode, Chester getting owned, unknown motives for our Bakamono, and and twins. Hashtag best episode yet. My hashtag ice cold is when Henry was like that. Hidden sake is only for us and no one else. Certainly not you crackers, LOL. Ooh, dangerous to say crackers this week, although you might get a better job. Favorite episode yet, and I said that last week too, more frustrated than ever on the question of why Chester is being haunted, which is a great hook that has me unable to wait another week. Lou Gehrig, I struck that bum out. Ice cold. Oh, such a good ice cold moment. El Quint sent us tweets about the fourth episode and the fifth episode. Listeners, we've got a bunch of great feedback today, but I have to be honest, I see the download stats and there are hundreds, 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 hundreds of you who haven't been giving us any feedback We want to hear from you. As Catfish wisely pointed out, we're not making any monetary gain on this. We're just really doing it to talk about fun shows like The Terror Infamy with you. So please, do us a favor. Tell your friends about the hashtag Ice Cold Podcast and give us some feedback. We definitely listen. Here's some more feedback from Twitter. It's from our good friend Shakes of Thrones at Shakes of Thrones on Twitter. They write, let me take time to praise at cjg man 67 for being the voice of reason in every podcast you guys do it's so true i didn't even have to say it and yes this was by far the best episode yet so she's talking about episode four people really have turned around on the season over the last two episodes catfish i agree the last two episodes really seem to be going somewhere also this goes to show you if you pout and beg for some praise you just might get it. So take this into take that lesson into your work environment. And Chester doesn't pout at all. That's why he doesn't get brace. <laughs> now, Bubba. Yeah. We have got some double Fs. Double Fs. Yeah, famous followers. Ooh. So would you like to re- would you like to tell us who our famous followers are and read their tweets? Well, I'll read this first one. It's from the okay. actress who plays Amy Yoshida. On the terror infamy, Amy, as we all know, is there having to be a secretary and try to keep her man, Ken, out of trouble for standing up to his principles. And it's the actress Miki Ishikawa. Hopefully I've pronounced that correctly. Beautiful. And she writes, waiting for at double PHQ to drop their podcast about hashtag the terror episode four. Like I thought it was Doug the dog from up. Oh, it was. It was. Yeah. Did you not want to give Pixar a free advertisement? You know, Disney might come after us, so I decided to stay safe there. All right. Well, I don't know. I thought maybe maybe we get ten dollars off our next visit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and then yeah. kind of in replying to that, our old famous follower, and by old I mean she's OG from at least a couple episodes ago. <laughs> now Oko Mori 
who plays poor beleaguered Chester's mom. She deserves better than that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, she said, they are brilliant. And then she said, correction, double B. Double B. Bloody brilliant. Oh. Yes. Oh, so that was awesome. Very excited. We're sorry to have kept you waiting. I don't know. Maybe they weren't waiting this week. Maybe they're like, all right. You know what? Maybe they were like, we gave them such good ratings last week. They're like, I don't need to listen anymore. Let me say that once again, listeners, you can join us at Double PHQ. That's the word double, the letter P, then the letters HQ for headquarters at Double PHQ on Twitter and Instagram, Facebook.com slash Double PHQ. And on our Facebook page, we have a true double L, Peter in Australia, who wrote, he really liked episodes four and five of the Terror Infamy. Finally, the show has taken off. The stuff at the camp was great. However, the Chester storyline still lets the show down, in his opinion. As you guys mentioned on the podcast for episode four, Chester's smart arse comments to the soldiers just didn't ring true. In episode 5, his interrogation of the captured Japanese soldier was confusing. How did the soldier know stuff about Chester and Chester's fear of the evil spirit? That whole scene was very confusing. And then Chester lets him kill himself? I didn't get that at all. And let me say, Peter, I when we review this episode, that is going to be kind of my one glaring weakness in the show is the end of this really great relationship and really great performance by this Japanese prisoner. That was just incredible. I thought, great acting. But, uh, yeah, we'll get to that in a bit. We got two more bits of feedback. Catfish, can you read them? All right. Narcissus at Flower Girl 67 not the kind that you sniff, but the kind you bake with, Flower Girl 61 says, have to wait as usual until Friday for Episode 5 on Prime Europe, so don't mind the pushback. Thank you, Narcissus. You're the only one who's like, this thing isn't late. I but know. you might be the only one who's like, this thing is crap. So it's a it's possible win-lose situation. Narcisse is also a great double L over in Europe. She downloads many of our shows. We love hearing from her. And I also love hearing from at Clobberchop. At Clobberchop, indeed, on Twitter, who gave this most recent episode 9 out of 10 triple Bs. Triple Bs? Baseballer belly butchers. Oh, oh nice. That's better than what I came up with. Well, Cap- Damn you, clobber shop. Well, Clapfish, what is your ranking for episode five, Shatter Like a Pearl? Well, I was going to give it triple Bs. Triple Bs? Was, yeah, boring baseball banter. Aw. But then I realized the more appropriate scale was the triple F scale. Triple F? So I gave it seven frequent freaky fakeouts. <laughs> This is the second, not favorite, frequent Freaky Fake Out. This is the second episode in a row where there was something that seemed like it was spooky and then just turned out to be they had a rational explanation for it, which sort of turned the tables in a way that was cool. That, you know, the Yore wasn't both back at home and in the Guadalcanal. But also, I feel like you can go to that well multiple times. Try not to do it two episodes in a row. We really start to catch on. And then while there was a lot of creepy stuff, there was a lot of stuff that was unbelievable. It was not just about the guy knowing about Chester. And it was not just about Chester not getting in trouble for the guy killing himself. It was also the dead body that makes it overseas without... The dead body in the dripping double B. Double B? Yeah, b- a bloody bag. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, that doesn't get found. No one notices that the dude is acting extra strange. I mean, they, this is not a quick trip. You uh, know what? This is why we need the TSA to check these bags on these flights for yeah, any Yukos. Yeah. So there was a lot of cool stuff, but there was a lot of stuff that, that just – just this does not ring true for me and just just wasn't thought through i mean even at the beginning when uh, i mean in the end it turns out that it is uh reed diamonds that is his um that is his, sort of his commander there chester's commander in guadalcanal yeah that's stalling yeah, yeah yeah you go you go and you go and hang out with him but don't talk to him which Seems silly. Why would you have the only people who can understand him go babysit him and not talk to him? It's not clear that that was really his motive. When Chester comes to him and says, can I talk to him? He says, yeah, sure. But it just seems 
but that was the real, that was really the most minor thing. It was the it was the fake out with Ota, which uh, otherwise I thought the scenes were brilliant and and touching. Also, uh, we lost Chester's buddy. No, oh, yeah. Uh, we're just going to call him Marcus Toji because that's his actual name. That we lost agreement. him for a couple episodes, for a couple of scenes, and although it made the scenes seem stronger, uh, we could have should have an explanation for that, considering how wild Chester was acting. It didn't seem like Marcus would be just like, yep, yeah, you've got this covered. <laughs> so there was a lot of stuff that... So while there was some cool, creepy stuff, I felt like there were so many things that didn't make sense that it really just... It really brought my enjoyment of the episode down, which is why I gave it seven. I mean, I felt like up, 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 and then I felt like this episode was a down. Catfish, I think I like this episode just a tick more than you did. And sure enough, I'm giving this episode five of season two, I'm giving it eight. What I like to call double L's out of den. Double L's? Well, as you know, double L stands for loyal listeners. But in this episode, what it really stood for was later lose. Lose is leaving, baby. And... It was tragic to see what has happened to this character, Luz. I thought the camp has normally been the best place for the action so far, but in this week's episode, I thought the camp was a bit weaker. But I love that scene with Chester and the Japanese prisoner, even though the turn at the end where Chester allows him to commit suicide, I thought that was crazy. I thought it proved that Chester really hadn't grown any. And that he's okay. I mean, the thing, the thing that's really strange is the main takeaway here is People don't trust the Japanese-American soldiers with the Japanese. So number one, to leave them alone. And number two, be like, oh, that's okay that somehow he got away and killed himself. And it was that was a real wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Like, yes. You knew what happened, right? So it's like they had more information to get out of that guy. And that's, I mean, I would, you think the assumption would be, whoa, they he was giving comfort and aid to the enemy by letting kill himself so that, we wouldn't get information. That's what I would assume, yeah. Colonel Stallings, a.k.a. our good improvised buddy, Reed Diamond. Yeah, what was he doing? I, I just didn't get it. His character doing, obviously. It just didn't make, it just didn't make sense. And then, of course, they, I mean, if we're, I'm blowing through the whole thing, but, like, they take that in stride. And when the guys are maybe going out somewhere for just a ride, they assume, let's just fire at them. They must be escaping. I think Colonel. I think Colonel Stallings did see the gun being pointed at Jester. Now, why he didn't just let the guy get shot? Who knows? But Catfish, listen. We have given our rankings of this episode, listeners. Once again, who cares what we think? We want to hear well, what I, you I care think. What, I care what you think. Okay, Hold that's on. great. That's totally. I don't. But uh, okay, but tell us what you think. Please write to us. Please tell your friends about this if they're enjoying the terror infamy as well. At Double P H Q on Twitter and Instagram, Facebook.com slash Double P H Q. Catfish, why don't we start with the thing that I thought was the most tragic, and that's my girl Luz, who, like her man Chester, is seeing visions. Some kids are playing hide and seek in the woods there by the camp. Oh, but the beautiful thing mm. is this this I love this setup. You see a creepy figure from far away. She's wearing like a white shift. She's mm -hmm. dirty. And they're like, there's the ghost woman. Oh, yeah. And it's a perfect turnaround because I did believe that it was the Bakimono. So when it turned out to be Luz, I thought that was an awesome moment. That was a nice – that's some trickeration that I can get behind. And Luz has just been so broken that she's seeing these visions of dead children in the water – she is freaking out the camp. Like, the prisoners probably were already treating her tough because she wasn't of Japanese descent. But then for her to have just let go of everything... She loses it. I don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> so Luz gets a visit from her father. And, mm -hmm. yeah, it's just more bad news for Luz. Luz, you had a brother, Dennis. He's dead. He died in North Africa fighting. Oh, my, wow, terrible can this be. It was kind of a nice ice cold moment. There was no dialogue, but the father, before he speaks at her, speaks to her, looks at her, and he's kind of like, ooh. <laughs> ice just cold. Looking at her. Yeah, yeah. So the dad is begging his daughter, possibly her, his only child left, to come home. They go and see with, I assume, somebody who can release Luz. And these questions were so ridiculous. What kind of food did you eat for dinner? Japanese mm -hmm. food. 
oh my god, this is just terrible. But Luce probably does need to get away from the camp, does need a bit of escape. Well, I I had talked about this last week. Like I said, you know, there's nothing holding her there. Now, I didn't know that she would be so bereft, but it makes sense. Go home and be with people who love her. Not that Chester's family hasn't come close to her. And, in fact, this was another touching moment from this episode. Right. But, you know. Right. Well, let's just get to it. It takes about three to five days to process this release. And Luz, as she's leaving, she says to Chester's parents, she says, you know, I want to give Yuko this gift she gave me back. Uh-oh. Ding, 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 ding. Mm-hmm. Trouble. But then I think mm-hmm. the heartwarming moment you're talking about is Henry, who's gone on quite a journey himself in these five episodes. Mm-hmm. He goes and hugs his would-be daughter-in-law as she's leaving. And that mm-hmm. was a nice moment for all the characters. That was a really nice moment. And there it was. Triple L. Triple L. Yeah, lucky leaving Luz. Oh, man. Do you think this is it? Or is Luz with us through the end of the season two, Catfish? Oh, I can't. God. I, that's a great question because the weird thing is, is, is I feel like we're not going to lose her. But on the other hand, the uh, Bakimono has shipped out to Guadalcanal. There's no reason for her to go back unless she thinks unless she doesn't see her kids anymore and she thinks if i go back i'll see them that's where their ghosts are i imagine they'll do something like that to get her back to the camp what about you bubba you think she's done or no maybe this is terrible to say but because i knew this was focusing on the japanese american experience back in these terrible times i from the very beginning didn't think Luz would be much of a player but the fact that she is, in some ways, the co-lead of the show, I don't think we're going to lose her. And I'm glad we're not losing lose. Keep lose, baby. Yeah. Now, staying in the camp, Catfish, this was a storyline which I didn't quite enjoy as much. It starts off with these loyalty tests being handed out. The guys like Walt and Ken are very suspicious of this. And Yamato-san, who is, of course, George Takai, He is freaking out about filling out this form because back in 1925, he donated tinfoil to the Japanese Navy. Oh, no. And Amy gives him some advice. Hashtag say nothing. Do you think that's correct? Would the army back then, and of course we're having to guess what it would be like back in this time, would they really freak out that somebody gave tinfoil well before there was any conflict before the United States and Japan? Probably, based on what we're seeing. I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, based on the evidence they used to put everybody into camps, I would say, uh, yeah, silence is the best policy. Omission rather than commission. Well, I really think they're going to have to Reynolds wrap this case. Mm. Let's edit that out. That was bad. It's <laughs> very bad. No, leave it in. I no. want people to know I'm not the worst. Okay. Now, our boy Major Bowen who has always kind of given off vibes that he's really not very nice. He sees Amy talking about these things, and he's like, listen, these prisoners, and why should these Americans be prisoners? Don't get me started. But he's saying they're not filling out the loyalty tests, and so we'll have to start talking consequences for noncompliance. Ooh, Major Bowen is becoming a major jerk. None of this makes any sense to me. And but not in the way of the logic of the show, because I'm sure this is I'm sure this is true. Mm -hmm. I just if your end game is we are going to keep these people in camps until the war is over. I don't understand why you feel like you need to do the loyalty tests and put some in other places. I it just so. So I'm not questioning the show. I'm questioning this stupid American government back then. It's just, this is just a stupid thing to do. You're already, they're already in cages, for God's sakes. No, I'm with you. This is, if it wasn't horrific already, the things they're having to do are horrific. And when you're in these horrific situations, if you're Amy and Ken and you're falling in love, there's just one thing to do. Get busy. Bounce. 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 They're doing double B. Bounce. 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 Double B. Barracks busying. Bounce. Oh, I thought it was. The beast with two backs. <laughs> yes, they are doing that, which uh, this is that was new to me. While he is completely right, 
I he's still just not very sharp. So you're I talking mean, about Amy's man, like Ken. A, yeah, I, I, I'm not a huge fan Ken. of Ken. Yeah. I'm not a huge fan of Ken. He comes across a bit, to me, a bit too modern again. Now, I think Ken, of course, the morals he's standing on is correct. But this is a dog and pony show, man. It's tough for me to say, but I tend to decide with Amy in this dispute. Who did you decide with in this yet no on 27, no on 28 proposition? Well, I mean, yeah, right. Exactly. Um, I mean, uh, like you, morally, I stand with Kent. And, and, and I think you can understand it, too, if, if we, I mean, you know, I, I guess we don't really need to see much more, really. But you can understand it, too, if you just say to yourself, like, if it had been, if his excuse had been, like, this is it. This is a bridge too far. We've been caged. You know what I mean? Right. I just I just feel like if he presented it in, in that way, it would have been better. I would have liked it better f- for the show. Whatever. I mean, again, it, it, the whole thing is a horrific outrage, but it, it's just um, – I can understand if he says, you know what, I just don't – I'm not going to go along anymore. And that, I mean, that's essentially what he says, and he says it very clearly. And this is, a, this is another problem that I had with this was all the guys say – when they step up in their papers, they announce how they filled them out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I just have a feeling that people would be listening. You know what I mean? Like, it's the kind of thing where if you're the oppressors, you want to say, like, I would, go, <clears throat> I would go to the boss and go, I would show them right away. Or say, like, these guys told me this. So the fact that, like, they loudly announce it and then he gets out of it because she changes his answers – was also a little little wonky to me. Did that bother you at all? It didn't bother me at all, but based on what I, the little we've seen of Ken, I would think this would mean the end of his relationship with Amy. This is like, this is a bridge too far. If if Ken's point is, I'm going to stand on this principle, you know, you can break me, you can push me, but you're not going to get me to lie. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Then, then he, her changing his answer could really ba- be bad trouble for this relationship, especially right. when when Bowen might be watching them get busy. Well, might. <laughs> Excuse me. Here, there is another thing, too, okay. that I feel like would really have happened here, and we saw an exact parallel to it earlier in the series, where Chester says to Luz, sit down, don't press the issue, and she does press the issue, and she ends up with him. I feel like the way Ken was presented when they're like, no, you filled it out, that he would have talked himself into going in with that group, especially with all the talking he's been doing throughout. So to me, the fact that it, it made more sense that he would have talked himself into being put in with that group, that he would have been like, oh, okay, well, uh, I guess I didn't. <laughs> These are the things that bother me. That I, it sounds like it did. That didn't bother you as far as like making you go wait, wait a second, and, and stopping me from enjoying some of it. No, the only thing that bothered me was the section we're going to cover over in Guadalcanal. Chester, who I really did like throughout most of the episode, when he handed over the knife and uncut the guy's arms. Oh my god, it, it just didn't seem like it made any sense. But let's get to that because I thought this really was. Until that moment, I thought this was great. It was great. Great cackling stuff between them. So it starts out, and I mentioned that Luz is seeing visions. Chester is seeing visions of Luz while in the field. And they're looking for this General Takahashi. Yeah, General Takahashi, who theoretically brainwashed and tortured Crittenden. What do you mean, theoretically? Well, it's possible that the Yure, the Bakimono, did that. The the Yure's been been overseas. This is... This is why, remember last week I was like, what is the URA here? Is the URA overseas? And so that made, this made, to me, this made it clear, especially the, when they pulled the rug from out from under our feet, that Ota was able to guess so many things amazingly that made it seem like he was the URA, but he wasn't. But the URA was, this was not the URA until the person showed up with the, not Jack in the Box, but URA in a bag. It's a Yuri in a bag. So this actor, I want to give him a shout out, and I will probably mispronounce his name. I apologize. But it's Kazuya Tanabe. 
he was great. I just loved him. I thought it was mm-hmm. perfect. He had me wondering, which is, I think, the state Chester was in. Is he just a prisoner who's dedicated to the cause, who's going to take out these traitors as he sees in Chester? And I just thought it was really good. And I, I guess I, the only problem I had with it is the baseball analogy. Chester realizes that the name in his little notebook were members of his baseball team, and they bond over that, and I like it. But mm, it was tough. Now it starts with this prisoner calling Chester a sheer a sheer yo. Do you know what a sheer yo is, Kevish? I don't. I don't remember either. <laughs> but it was definitely oh derogatory. <laughs> uh, well, I can imagine. Yes. Are you sure it's sheer yo? I'm just sort of looking up here, and it's sheer yo is a word for souls of the dead. Oh, that's a, right. Yeah, that sounds dead. perfect for Chester. Okay. Now, as you pointed out, Colonel Stallings. He's like, you guys can't engage. The white guys have to engage, which, you know, right. don't get started The only here. people in this camp who can understand him and talk to him don't engage. Now, this prisoner knew Chester's name, and he drops that Chester's name reference. Did How did he get Chester's name? Did Colonel Stallings accidentally mention it? Did Chester's friend accidentally mention it one time? This is, this I didn't, is confusing. I didn't, go, I didn't go back and watch and... and and if they did, I mean, that was smart. Then on, on, on the, the second go-round, it's still the same kind of fake-out we had last episode. Yeah, so Arthur... Whether they set it up well or not. So Arthur and Chester are there with this prisoner they're not supposed to engage with. And Arthur and Chester are just always complete opposites. Arthur is like, let's do this by the book. Let's do what we're told. He's a good soldier. Maybe we respect Chester more because Chester Chester does stand up for no, what's right a lot. <laughs> but Arthur, he seems to be the one who who follows the rules. But at a certain point, Arthur goes out for a smoke and never comes back and allows Chester and the <laughs> yes, prisoner to really bond. Time. Yeah, there is a hashtag ice cold moment when the prisoner says to Chester, "You've got nothing. Thought you could get away." Corpses of everyone you know is what you'll see, no matter how young. Oh, high school bastard. I love it. Oh, damn. Now, he says he's here to save Chester. He also says, hey, let's you and I slice our bellies open together like honorable samurai. <laughs> nice. Nice. I don't know, if I was Chester, I would have been like, whoa, whoa, whoa. How did I get, how did I get into this? Honorable samurai, Chester. Come on, let's do it. You and me. Chester's like, if I'm going to kill myself, I'll go down to the docks and have some bad liquor. (laughs) Another ice cold, just, it's not even so much ice cold, it's just a flat out diss. The prisoner says, if you don't free me, I won't spare you or your family. The ground will soak with their blood. I mean, you know, he really should write some lyrics for Danzig. He's doing great. I'm telling you, he really knows how to put the fear of God into Chester. But Chester has one bit of magic that he can pull out at any time. His camera. Oh, yeah, the magic camera. Because I see all. He takes a picture of this prisoner, Ota, and guess what? The face wasn't blurry. You're not a Yuri. Yuris have blurry faces. Get out of my camp. Chester's, Chester's magic camera. By the way, back then, how long does it take to develop something? To be like, I'll be, I'll be with you in a second. Listen, I gotta go get the room completely dark, the tent completely dark. In eight hours, you're gonna, you're gonna get it, buddy. Yeah, exactly. And he does get it because Chester beats the crap out of this poor prisoner. So Chester's a war criminal. <laughs> and then what do you do after you beat somebody up? You let him tell his life story. Bonding. Mm -hmm. There's an infamous ominous wind blowing around. And the prisoner is start humble bragging. He's like, oh, yeah, I struck out Lou Gehrig. Yeah, totally. Give it to me. Man, he is the man. And then he was he was he was just so great. He Uh, was. It was amazing. And it was just there was just a great, great scene between them. And, and it's it's after they have this bond when Chester does another one of his unforgivable Chester moments. And that is, he cut him free and gave him a blade. 
This, to me, now I know Chester is trying to show compassion for this guy, but Chester, how is that compassion? How is it? Are you nuts? This was wrong on every level. Chester, why not tell this guy, you know what, he can still live, and after the wall, war, he can still play baseball. I just hated this move, and that's why I dropped it down uh, from a real high ranking to eight. Admittedly, that's only two points, but this moment just really drove me nuts. Well, I mean, you have to, I mean, I think what you have to understand is that even though, and maybe it doesn't ring true because we think Chester's so Americanized, but I really think there is that that strong sense of of honor that like if 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 you commit a shame it's the most honorable thing to do and to let people do i mean i think i re- i remember even in was it the 70s or 80s when some japanese companies got busted for doing some bad stuff and some of the ceos committed harry carry i mean there is there you know i, I think you're not you're not understanding how powerful the sense of shame is in Japan as opposed to here. Americans are completely shameless, which is why we uh, elected the most shameless human being on the face of the planet. So I think, think Colonel Stallings to Americanize. So, but the question is: the question is, would Chester have internalized that enough to understand that's what the guy would have preferred? Over living and going forward, but I think from the I think from the Japanese soldier's point of view, I think that makes sense. The question is, you know, as as American as we think Chester is, I mean, you know, I'm waiting for him to, you know, get a, you know, start smoking a pack of Cool Miles and spit on the sidewalk. Would he have recognized that that was the right thing to do? But in any case, for Chester, it seems like a crazy thing to do. Just for his own, for his own safety. I mean, what side? What side is he on? And and I understand it's complicated by the fact that like everybody he knows in his family is being horribly treated by the by the American government. But if he's not concerned about his own safety, isn't he worried that like if he gets accused of consorting with the enemy, that this might redound on his family who's in captivity already? I mean, it's. It's a remarkably, in one way, it's a remarkably selfish move for him, and the fact that there's no consequences for it is kind of crazy. Hold on, hold on. Chester got important information about Admiral Takahashi. Yeah, right. He got his Wikipedia page. Come on. Look, they didn't have Wikipedia (laughs) back then, so he got the Wikipedia page of Admiral Takahashi, and so Colonel Stallings was like, we good. No. Now, Catfish, the episode actually begins back in Long Beach, uh, laid back, down in Long Beach where these new translators are using some gallows humor because they're getting set to the front. And they keep mentioning, hey, this Terajima, remember when he used to be cool? And now he's freaky and he carries around this soaking bloody bag. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. How times have changed. Well, how did Yuko get all the way back to Long Beach, I wonder? I don't even know why we, Why is she so jammed up as as it was. Uh, you know, the it's funny the fact that all these other things have happened in this episode that have made me sad is that I, I have not come back to my continual complaint about this series, which is that five episodes... Because then we still don't know why this thing is haunting Chester and his family and Luz. Why, what, what did he do? Now, we yeah. do get a, maybe a slight clue just at the very end. All right, let's hear it. Tell, talk us through it, Catfish. All right, so first of all, let me say Arthur, A.K. Marcus Toji, is the man because I choose to believe that he was not taken over by the URA, but that he's decided enough with Chester. <laughs> I'm going to take him at gunpoint. Oh, come on. And, but my, my question was, where the hell was Yure, the Yure taking him? So I don't know the answer to that. Leaving camp for where? The jungle? Just to torture Chester by himself? I don't get it. I did like the creepy bag action. Oh, it, it was so good. So good. My, 
one of my favorite, favorite Japanese horror movies called Audition, which is a great movie. Starts out very slow, and then things get absolutely batshit crazy just at the moment that is reminiscent of this creepy bag scene. And then yeah. the Yure calls him Taizo, which oh. means third son. Hmm. What so, could that possibly mean, Catfish? Uh, I mean, it could possibly mean the uh, – we'll finally find out to the answer to this question why he is being haunted. And maybe at that point, maybe at that point, our friend Naoko Mori is going to have some explaining to do. Uh-oh, spaghetti. I don't know whether she is going to – I don't know if that's the case, but – I hope so, because we didn't get enough for this episode except for her rut row moment when she got the little drummy drum. All right. Well, next week is entitled Tiazo, and it is described thusly. A story of the past provides insight into the present evil that stalks the Terminal Islanders. Chester returns home to his family, only to find that someone he was searching for is gone. Henry and Asako are faced with a difficult decision. Mm -hmm -hmm. So, third son. Mm -hmm -hmm. Can you read that? T- can you just read the title again? I uh, no. <laughs> How do you okay. pronounce it? Tiazo. Well, first, no, no, it's Taizo because Taizo. it's T A I. You said Tiazo. I was okay, like, wait sorry. a second. They become Italian all of a sudden? Hey, hey uh, it's me, uh, Chesterini. It's my third son, Tiazo. <laughs> um, so I, I, I just. There were a lot of things that bothered me about this week's episode, and, and I'm sad because uh, things are getting good, and there's still a lot of creepy moments. There's still just a lot of things that, that just don't seem to click for me. I think what you're most upset about is our good buddy Reed Diamond probably won't be in the episode anymore if Chester gets set back home. Oh, no, not Reed Diamond. He had such grand plans for him and Chester. They were going to do a buddy movie. Oh, man, a road to Guadalcanal. So Chester is apparently injured. Did that was that a, a multiple fracture I saw with bones sticking out, or was it just torn pants? I, I couldn't quite tell, but nonetheless, it seems like Chester uh, is going to go home in his own bloody bag. Listen to me, buddy. The fact that Chester can survive a flamethrower to the face, and everybody's talking about it. Chester is immortal. Chester, or he's already dead. He's the third dead son. Nice. You think we're done with? Uh, you think we're done with Reed? You think we're? De- you think we're? we're that we're that the, the minute the Yure got over uh, to Guadalcanal, now she's gonna find her way back again. Right. She's like, oh my goodness gracious! Why did I decide to ship ground? <laughs> oh no. Catfish, we haven't had many ice colds in this episode. Do you want to give your nominee and your favorite ice cold of this Shatter Like a Pearl episode? My favorite ice cold is really, as I said before, it's not spoken. It's Luz's dad who should really have sympathy for her, but when he sees her, he's kind of like, whoa, rough. Just that's what he's thinking internally. Yeah. You know, that, that's my that's my ice cold reaction. You know what? I'm think I'm gonna have to go to our good loyal listener El Quint, who said I struck that bum out Lou Gehrig ice cold. Yeah, and I did it before he had that unnameable disease. <laughs> Ouch, Rudy. So that's gonna be our ice colds for the week. Tweet us and talk to us about your ice cold. It's double. The letter P, then the letters HQ, at Double PHQ on Twitter and Instagram, Facebook.com slash Double PHQ. For everyone oh. here at Double P Podcast, my name's Bubba, and you can find me on Twitter at Fit and Trim. That's F I T T E N T R I M, at Fit and Trim on Twitter. And I am Catfish. You can hit me up at CJGman67 on Twitter. And you'll hear us next time on Ice Cool. Now, do not pick up your bags because some of the items may have shifted during the flight. Oh, my God.